Hello, everyone. How are y'all doing? Uh, thank you for joining us. This is obviously a very full house in a very small room, so hope everyone has enough elbow room here. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to talk to you about this topic today. Um, our talk is called Keeping That New Car Smell, Tips for Publishing Accessible Content, and it's only slightly about cars. Uh, so we have, oops, let's see if we can figure out how to advance the slide. There we go. Um, we have the slide in here because we're supposed to. I'm sure lots of us are marketers and have no technical abilities whatsoever, but if you can contribute to the Drupal community, please do. It's very important to, to give back to the open source community. Uh, Alex and I are both actually in um, Drupal camp organizations uh, locally and uh, found out that you can actually get Drupal org credits as marketers helping out with that sort of thing. So in case you all didn't know that as marketers, you can get that street cred. Um, I recommend you try it out if you can. Um, so quickly before we begin, I uh, just wanted to let you know where we're from. Uh, Alex and I are both from Palantir.net. Palantir is a full service digital consultancy uh, that's based out of Chicago and we actually all work uh, fully remote. Um, so Alex is based in Portland and I'm based in Denver. Um, we work with uh, clients in the healthcare, the nonprofit, higher ed, government spaces, and help them create uh, beautiful digital experiences and empower um, them to achieve their missions. So I'm the sales manager at Palantir.net. My name is Nelson Harris. Uh, I work with our clients and liaise with our team to help figure out the, the best solutions for our clients' problems. Hi, I'm Alex Brandt, the marketing manager at Palantir. I've been uh, in the Drupal world for the last five years, and I've been publishing all of Palantir's content for the last three years on our website and elsewhere online. Um, my background is in journalism, so a lot of my prior knowledge about content marketing was more relating to SEO rather than in uh, publishing up to accessibility standards. So now, as a non-technical member of a highly technical team, it's been pretty enlightening learning from our team of accessibility experts. Um, I'm by no means an accessibility expert myself, but today I wanted to share some of the things that I've learned along the way. Uh, today we'll be talking about what access accessibility is and why it's important. We'll go over a couple of the ways that users might be consuming your content. We'll share our 10 tips for publishing accessible content, and then we'll also talk about how technology helps. So some of the parameters that Drupal has built in, and then uh, some of the tools that we use. So, Let's start with the basics. Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, and that they can contribute to the web. One in four Americans are disabled. That's 61 million people. Some of the common disabilities you might think of as people who are affected by web accessibility might be people with low vision or blindness or deafness, but web accessibility also affects those with temporary or situational disabilities. This might be someone who's working from a crowded coffee shop and has a slow internet connection, or someone who's working from a crowded conference area and they're either surrounded by distractions or they don't want to become a distraction themselves by playing audio out loud. So why is accessibility important to us as marketers? A lot of us in the agency world work on pretty lean marketing teams. At Palantir, you could consider our marketing team to be one and a half people. That's me and then Nelson whenever I can steal some of his time. That means that every aspect of our efforts needs to be optimized in order for us to reach our goals. So if someone isn't seeing a blog post or a case study that you published or listening to a podcast, you don't want to um, use a marketer don't care, sorry. Uh, it doesn't mean that you as a marketer don't care about delivering that information to those audiences. It just means that you have to adapt in the way that you are delivering them. So accessible websites have better search results, reduced maintenance costs, and increased audience reach, and then there might be legal ramifications for ignoring accessibility. So yeah, if you decided to join us today for this talk, I assume you probably realize that accessibility is really important. Um, perhaps you were tasked within your organization. Sorry, if, I, if you can't hear me, let me know, but I gotta kinda do this thing. Uh, <laughs> these mics are not tall enough for me. Um, so you, maybe you've been tasked with uh, publishing accessible content within your organization. Um, and I think a lot of these kind of talks and, and in those kind of environments, we talk a lot about WCAG standards and uh, to the letter, sort of how to follow accessibility standards. What we wanted to do in this presentation was just contextualize it a little bit and talk about um, some of the ways that people are actually consuming your content um, when you're publishing uh, for the accessible web. So um, two ways that people with disabilities are going to consume your content are through what's called an assistive technology or by using an adaptive strategy. So an assistive technology is something like a screen reader or a screen magnifier, and an adaptive strategy is more of a technique that they might use to make the interaction better, like zooming in or reducing their mouse speed or, or making the text larger on a page. 
So uh, since we're about to share a bunch of those to the letter, how to follow accessibility rules, I uh, thought it might be great to take a look at actually what it looks like to use an assistive technology. How many, by a show of hands in this room, have actually ever seen a blind person interact with uh, with a screen reader before. Okay, so a little looks like a little less than half. I actually had never before we started the preparation for this talk, and I found this short YouTube video. It's just gonna be like a 20 second clip, but I wanted to share it because I think it's really critical to actually, if you haven't seen this, to see how it works. So let's, let's watch. Example, I could just keep reading. Banner, three items. Visited, link, image, home. Line by line, and we could be here all day. Or I could jump to the first heading on the page. Heading level two, search for heading level two. You are here. Heading level one, make videos accessible. So as I'm moving down through the page, I can look for the category that interests me. So super short clip, but you can see how the screen reader is actually focusing on different heading levels and calling them out. Goes to the things we're going to talk about, about semantic markup and heading hierarchy and all these things, which get really just sort of become like, oh, yeah, of course you're supposed to do that. But I thought this was so great to kind of see how um, how somebody actually interacts with that stuff. And if I can find my cursor, we'll proceed. Oh, and we got to switch back to the thing. There we go. So how do you keep that new car smell? Uh, say you're just handed the keys to your new website, and after months of your team of designers and developers working really hard to make sure that they're Building and designing everything with accessibility in mind, now it's up to you to maintain that level of accessibility for your users. Uh, we compiled our list of tips from a few different resources online, including the WCAG standards, W3C, and then our team at Palantir. Our first tip is to provide meaningful text alternatives. Text alternatives should help your audience understand the content and context of each image, video, or audio clip. It also makes that information available to technology that can't see or hear your content, like um, a search engine. So for images, you can provide alternative text. This is especially important if you do a lot of email marketing, because accessibility aside, if you have an email that you're sending out with a lot of images and someone has images turned off to preserve data, you want to make sure that your email still makes sense. For audio, you should provide a transcript. Um, one resource that I've found really helpful is rev.com. You can upload an audio or video file, and then it charges you a dollar per minute, and usually within one business day, they'll send you back the transcript, and then you can just give it a quick proofread and upload it to your piece of content. Um, and then for uh, video, make sure that you're providing captions and video descriptions in action. Our second tip is to write proper alt text. Alt text is a brief text description that can be attributed to the HTML tag for an image on a web page. Including that alt text enables users who can't see the images on a page to better understand your content. Um, it also provides that meaning to uh, screen readers and other assistive technology. So when you're writing alt text, be as descriptive and accurate as possible. Provide context, especially if your image is serving a specific function. Uh, people who don't see the image should have the same understanding as if they had. And then if you're sharing um, a chart or other piece of data, make sure to include that data in the alt text so people have all the important information. Avoid using phrases like image of or picture of. It's already assumed that uh, the alt text is referencing an image and you're losing precious character space. Most screen readers cut off alt text at around 125 characters. Uh, the caveat to this is if you're referencing a piece of art um, or an illustration. And then no spammy keyword stuffing. So uh, alt text does help with SEO, but that isn't its primary purpose, so don't abuse it. Find that happy medium between providing all the context someone needs and also maybe one or two of those keywords that you're trying to target. So Nelson, how would you write alt text for this image? Uh, red car in the sky. Right. You might say red car in the sky. But an even better version of alt text for this would be illustration of red car with flames shooting out of the back, flying over a line of cars on a sunny roadway. You want to provide that extra context. Our third tip is to establish a hierarchy. So far we've given you a couple of examples relating to the text on your site, but accessibility is more than just making everything on a page available as text. It also affects the way you structure your content and how you guide users through a page. So when you're drafting content, put the most important information first. Group similar content and organize uh, different topics with headings. You wanna make sure your ideas are organized in a logical way to improve scannability. And then use structural elements to support that hierarchy. Users should be able to quickly assess what information is on a page and how it's organized. 
By using headings, subheadings, lists, sections, and other structural elements, it helps establish that hierarchy and makes web pages easily understandable by humans and screen readers. So a quick little story for you. Whenever Palantir relaunched a web our website a couple of years ago with a new theme, I was publishing a blog post and I decided that the H2 styling was really big and I just didn't like how it looked, so I opted to use the H3 instead. Because I had this personal preference, I used this in this one blog post, I used it in case studies, event listings, all over our website. It was a real accessibility blunder on my part, and once I realized that what I had done, it took me a whole entire afternoon to go back and fix things, but then it also might have been really hard for users to navigate those pages during that time. Here's an example of a tool you can use to catch mistakes like mine. It's called Wave, and all you have to do is enter in a URL, and it pops out this handy little sidebar where it'll flag any accessibility errors. So you can see um, it shows that I skipped a heading level. Here's that same page when the headings are fixed, uh, but you can see that Wave will also show you an outline of the structural elements that you've used so you can better visualize how someone who might be using assistive technologies is navigating through your page. The main point here is that your uh, page title should always be your H1, and heading levels should never be skipped for your personal styling preferences. And then our fifth tip is to write a descriptive title for every page. This one's pretty straightforward. Users should be able to quickly assess the information uh, and purpose of each page, and screen readers announce the page title when they load a page. So writing a descriptive title helps those users make uh, more informed page selections. Thank you. <laughs> Tip number six is to be intentional with your link text. So when you're sitting down to write link text, uh, you want to think about how you can make each link's purpose really clear and, and uh, obvious to the user. You want links to provide info on where the, the user will end up if they actually click on the link. Um, and it's 2019, so I really hope no one is still using click here as their link text. Um, make sure that you're providing context about your links before instead of after the links, so that if somebody is using a screen reader and they're actually reading through a page and they're skipping to that link, by the time that that screen reader hits that link, they'll feel, feel comfortable knowing where it is that they're actually about to go if they click on it. Um, don't be lazy and put URLs as link text. Uh, I'm sure we can all imagine the, uh, the hellish nature of having a screen reader read uh, 100 unique characters uh, <laughs> off <laughs> like it's a, an auctioneer. Um, avoid writing long paragraphs with multiple links peppered in throughout. Uh, if you have multiple links to share on a topic, instead try to uh, group them all at the end in a bulleted list and keep your paragraph uh, on its own. So this is an example of the right way and the wrong way to uh, write your link text. So obviously, want to learn more, click here is, is a no-go. And uh, learn more about accessibility does what we're trying to achieve by explaining some context there. Number seven is to avoid images of text in place of actual text. And you'd be surprised how often this actually happens. Um, so the guideline here is uh, by the W3 is to make it easier for users to see and hear content, including separating foreground from the background. So um, there are exceptions, as, as for everything, there are exceptions to this rule. If you have a logo or something like that that has text on it, that's, that should be fine. Um, but in most cases, we want to separate the two, make the text selectable and highlightable and detectable by a screen reader. Um, there are actually other reasons that this is good and, and should be intuitive for people in addition to the fact that it's an accessibility thing. Um, for example, SEO benefits, the fact that if you're doing a, a find um, on a page with a command F or something like that as a user, you can find it. Um, and then obviously uh, selectable, copy paste, that sort of thing, editable within the CMS. So this is a client that we worked on recently um, to do an accessibility audit for. Uh, and this is the, the after of, of kind of us helping them. But they would do um, these hero images of their campus, and they would put this white text overlay on top of it or another color. And there's a couple of reasons that this is, is uh, an accessibility blunder. Um, partly what I talked about where we're, you know, we want to keep that text highlightable and separated. But also, the contrast was uh, varying depending on what the background image was. So right, you want to actually have what we instituted was this kind of semi-transparent green background so that we're maintaining that contrast ratio across everything. And also, that's uh, editable within the CMS that you can change that um, apply to NDSU thing to whatever you feel like it, uh, it should be. All right, number eight is avoid idioms, jargon, abbreviations, and other non-literal words, or as I like to say, of, you know, no blah, blah, blah. Uh, just get right to the content. Um, this is important for us as marketers in the Drupal world because um, it's easy to include a bunch of jargon uh, that your client audience might not be familiar with. Um, 
you know, I think when, when you're writing, it's a good rule of thumb to sort of ask yourself, would my friend or a family member know uh, what it is that I'm talking about? Even if they don't fully understand the subject, would they use that kind of language? And if you think about it this way, um, when people are searching, obviously, on a search engine or something like that, they're going to be searching in uh, their natural language, so they're not going to use your, your super uh, technical industry abbreviations that you uh, think were super smart for including. Um, so be accessible and client friendly, and if you have to use those jargon or abbreviations, which sometimes we do, um, try to provide a definition, uh, link to that definition somewhere, or include an explanation of any abbreviations the first time that you're using them. Number nine is to create clear content for your audience's reading level. So don't leave them looking like this poor woman and asking what's going on. Um, this means writing to a lower, lower secondary education level, actually. Um, so even if you're marketing to a group of savvy technical individuals, as many of us maybe in the room are, um, you know, we want our, our individuals to be uh, reading this material in a way that is easy for them. Um, big words are stressful, and a lot of us are reading quickly, and while we're busy, maybe we're at a conference, um, and uh, so we want to make sure that we're not overcomplicating things. From an accessibility standpoint, this affects folks with uh, cognitive disabilities or reading disabilities like, like dyslexia. Um, and if you need to include technical or complicated material to get your point across, once again, um, provide some sort of supplemental content like an infographic or an illustration or something like that um, to, to kind of show the key points. There are a number of online tools that you can use to determine the readability of your content, actually. So something like WebAIM has a, a really great way of kind of giving you guidelines on how to write clearly. And we're going to link some resources for you all at the end so you don't have to take copious notes on what I just said if you're interested in checking that out. Last but not least of our tips is number 10, clearly label your form input elements. So as, as marketers, forms are our best friends, and I'm sure many of you have written forms before. Um, I really like this illustration and this GIF because it kind of shows not only do you want to really clearly label those elements, but you want to show kind of an indication of exactly what you're looking for. I love those icons of like the plane landing and the plane taking off. It's just very visual and very intuitive, and it works well with um, people of kind of all types of disabilities from an accessibility standpoint. Um, mark your required fields. That should be pretty obvious. Um, and uh, as a bonus, it's just going to be better data for you as a marketer if you're, if you're being really clear and obvious with your form fields. OK, so this is a recap of those 10 tips. I will pause if people would like to take a photo of this. But again, um, we are going to be sharing all this stuff kind of at the end for you guys. We're going to publish a blog post. Um, so you feel free to um, take photos now, but also um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure you have access to this. I see some cameras still clicking. All right, I'm going to going to move on. Um, so since it's DrupalCon, I uh, wanted to touch on just a couple of things that Drupal specifically does to support accessibility. Um, there are a few features that actually enable uh, visitors to skip around with something like a screen reader or if they're tabbing through on their keyboard um, to find the information that they're looking for a little bit more easily. So some of those things are there's a tabbing manager that's built into Drupal 8 which is essentially allows you to keep the focus of what somebody's tabbing through or set the order of what that is. So for example on a form if somebody is tabbing through that form you can make that tabbing manager lead that person correctly through the form as opposed to sort of bopping around all over the place on the page and getting lost. Um, Drupal 8 also provides a framework for audio or oral alerts, um, which is basically when a screen reader is focused on a web page and something dynamically changes on that web page that isn't within the focus of the screen reader like we saw in that example, it still gives the, the person that's using it an alert saying, hey, heads up, something actually just changed on this page and you should pay attention to that, which is pretty great. Uh, and then there are these things called ARIA landmarks that split the page out into chunks so that it can be skipped over more easily. So here's kind of an illustration of how that works. It's sort of like semantic markup where you can put different sections and, and sort of uh, uh, boxes around these things, but it's a little bit more um, built for accessibility specifically. It's so that a screen reader can pick it up and read it, and it's kind of ahead of the game uh, as far as uh, allowing uh, folks to use this from an accessibility standpoint. So you can kind of see the containers here. Um, you should still use semantic markup. It supplements it, essentially. Um, it's kind of like a, an attribute that you put on your HTML tags. Uh, so then I, I wanted to also mention specifically for content editors, there are some things that I like to call guardrails that Drupal kind of allows and, and adds. Uh, some of these are out of the box, and some of them you have to configure. Um, but a few things out of the box is that alt text is required 
by default for images, which means at least you won't forget to add alt text. You might still make a blunder on how you do your alt text. Um, so make sure you're following the tip that we gave you about how to actually put the alt text in correctly. Um, then uh, also Drupal 8 outputs semantic HTML5 markup, uh, which you know, kind of does the same thing as the ARIA thing from the perspective of a screen reader and kind of moving around. And as a bonus, it's uh, good for SEO. And then um, from a configuration standpoint, you can use the workbench module um, to create like a publishing workflow. So if you're a larger organization, maybe you have a junior content editor that's putting in stuff um, and making some accessibility blunders, and maybe you've got someone, that maybe it's you at your organization who is learning more about accessibility and has uh, some of the understanding of how to, to make those things better and improve on them. And so before that stuff goes live, that would be sent to you as a draft that you could approve or, or um, make changes to. So you have all these tips now and you're probably wondering where do you start? We recommend starting by assessing where your site currently stands. So there are a handful of tools out there you can use to measure your site's current level of accessibility. We recommend Site Improve, which has a free Google Chrome plugin and then a more extensive paid option as well. We use Site Improve at Palantir to scan our site on a regular basis and it flags things for us um, relating to the WCAG standards as well as broken links, missing alt text or other editorial issues. And then create an editorial style guide. This is especially important if you have multiple content authors. Um, it might include your own tips on writing alt text or special use cases for your company, but it just makes sure that you're able to um, communicate how content should be published in a consistent manner to all those different content authors. And then begin with incremental improvements. Once you have a good idea of what needs to be fixed, you can kind of gather the human resources needed to make those changes and divide and conquer as a team. I'm sure we all wish there was a magic moment where we could be hands off on a site and know that everything we've ever published over time is completely accessible, but the truth is accessibility requires constant monitoring and awareness, so the best thing you can do is establish a process and appoint someone responsible for championing accessibility for your users. And then here's a list of the resources that we use to put together the presentation, and like Nelson said, we are more than happy to send those out to anyone who would like them. Thank you. Uh, and come see us in the exhibit hall at booth 709 and join us for trivia night tomorrow night. It'll still be fun even if you're not a developer and don't know a lot about Drupal. I have done Drupal trivia twice now and I think I knew at least a few of the answers. So, <laughs> yeah. And if you guys want um, those tips, feel free to just come up. We'll give you a business card or something. We'll send it to you. You can give us your business card. And then also check out palantir.net, which is our website. And Alex is going to post a really pretty beautiful blog post that summarizes this whole talk and gives you all the links that you need. Um, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.